This passage is about the Great Commission. And I grew up in an evangelical tradition, and I heard this passage preached on time without number. And it's about go, go, go. Go to Papua New Guinea. Go to Africa. Go to South America. Go, go, go. And I want to tell you that I don't think it says what I grew up hearing that it said. I don't think it's any less for that. I think it's really amazing. It's a really powerful passage of scripture. But I think that it might say it in a way that we probably haven't heard it before. Uh, we're looking together at uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20 is going to be our primary text this morning. Um, it's on page 835 in the Pew Bibles. I'd really love it if you'd follow along with me. If you brought your own Bible, the page number, you're on your own. So the passage begins this way. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. Now there's something incomplete. There's something imperfect about the number 11. There were 12 Old Testament patriarchs. There were 12 apostles. And Matthew is okay with telling us that the 11 went. But that didn't go over very long. If you look at Acts chapter 1, the church got together again and said, hey, we're one short. We need somebody else. So they drew lots and they appointed another to be an apostle. Matthias, it's your job. You be the apostle. And then you never hear of him again. Because he wasn't the twelfth apostle. Who was the twelfth apostle? Paul. So come to VBS this week because we're doing Paul in the catacombs in Rome and, and you can hear all about Paul. But he was the twelfth. It says in Revelation that 144,000 are saved. Now that's not the total number of those who are saved. It's a gross. It's 12 Old Testament patriarchs, 12 New Testament apostles, 12 times 12 is 144. It's complete. It's full. It's all there. But here at the beginning of our passage of the Great Commission, it's not. We're elevenish. We're imperfect. We are incomplete. God uses an imperfect church in order to do His perfect will in the world. We're not all together. We're not all there yet. And so the eleven go to where Jesus told them to meet Him on the mountain. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. Now, in Judaism, they were sticklers for monotheism. They were sticklers for you don't worship angels, you don't worship people, you don't fall down. They went into the, the, the fiery furnace in Daniel because they wouldn't bow their knee to other gods. They went into the lion's den. Christians were persecuted. Jews were persecuted for uh, worshiping other than God, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. And yet here is Jesus. Now, this is post-resurrection. He's risen from the grave. They're in the presence of Jesus, and they have decided that this itinerant carpenter, teacher, preacher from Nazareth is God himself. And it tells us twice in this chapter, verse 9 and verse 17, that the disciples fell down at his feet and they worshipped him. You don't worship anybody but God. And yet they worshipped Jesus as if Jesus was God. And then I love this. But some doubted. I love the Bible. I hate that the Bible has been translated by religious people because religious people have all kinds of weird um, scruples and, and uh, hang-ups and problems that they have with the text. Matthew is down-to-earth, honest, and he's being real here. The disciples were worshipers, but some doubted. Now, actually, in the aorist tense, it is they doubted. The 11, and I had a stack of commentaries, and they all wanted to change what the text says because they're not happy with the text. Did you grow up in a church where you weren't allowed to ask questions? Did you grow up in a church where doubts your doubts and stop asking questions and you're being a pain in the neck and leave it alone and you're never going to understand it? It's by faith and stop having all these doubts. That's terrible. Matthew says they were worshipers who doubted. They're bipolar. I'm bipolar. You're bipolar. And you don't get any medication for it. That's who we are as human beings this side of glory. We worship as best we can, as much as we know of Christ, with as much as we know of ourself, and yet there will always be questions. There will always be doubts. And that is okay. Please come to Bible study on Mondays and bring your questions and bring your doubts and we'll talk about them. 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Doubting worshipers are the material that Jesus uses to build his church. They are the material that goes out into the world with the message of the good news of the gospel. We don't have to pretend to be other than we are. It's the human condition. We worship, we believe, but there's always something in the back of our minds. There's always something going on in our lives. There's always somebody in our lives that's hurting and we don't understand. God, you promised to be with us and where are you in this? And he's there. But we just don't always see it the way from God's angle and God's point of view. Doubting worshipers. I love it. It's fabulous. And then in verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, it's a Greek word, it appears came. It appears 52 times, one for each week of the year uh, in Matthew's gospel. In 50 of those 52 times, and this is not one of those cases, 50 of the 52 times it, it's describing a petitioner, pros el phone, one who comes to another petitioning, asking for something. So the father of the child who was demon possessed, he pros el phone, he came to Jesus. It's a picture of the patience of God. It's a picture of the condescension of God. And it's a picture of God, Jesus, who always takes the initiative. See, he's got doubting disciples. And he doesn't move away from them. I'll be back when you get your act together. I'll be back when you're a spiritual giant. I'll be back when you've gone to seminary. I'll be back when you've gone to the SAS Academy and you got all your questions answered. Then I'll come back and then you will be fit for me to use. No, he takes them as they are, pro cell phone, and he comes to them. For God so loved the world that he gave, he sent his only son. He always takes the initiative. He's always moving toward his disciples. And it isn't based on their perfection. It isn't based on how good they are. It's based on, we'll get to that in just a second. And he came to his disciples, and he's not a petitioner. We'll get to that in a minute. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And he said to them, and this is amazing. I grew up in the 1960s, and that was the height of the space program. I grew up in suburban D.C., not far from Goddard Space Flight Center. And I loved, like most of you probably did, uh, the right stuff and the, the space program and sending people up into space and to the moon and all of that. The guy that got strapped to the rocket ship, who sat on the bullet, he was called the mission commander. He was in charge of the capsule that he was sitting in. He's the mission commander. What Jesus is about to say, and this is the structure of this passage, it's a sandwich. It's the mission commander, the mission commands, and then it's about the mission commander again. Here is the mission commander, Jesus. I am in charge here. Where's here? Everywhere. The whole cosmos, the whole created order. Jesus, I am in charge here. What are the commands? There are four, move out, disciple, baptize, and teach. Those are the commands. And then it's about Jesus again. And he says, teach all that I have commanded and I am with you always to the end of the age. He's got all authority and he's with us always to the end of the age. It's fabulous. Now, I wish you could see it in the Greek. I wrote it out in five lines. There are five lines to the Great Commandment, or Commission. And he comes to the Great Commission right now. So let's look at it together. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all, that's the first all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then second, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Right, the second one. Now, this third one is implicit. It's not explicit. It doesn't exactly say it, but listen. Baptizing them in all of God, all of God's name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not in the name of the Son, not in the name of the Spirit, all of God. Baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then another all, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and I am with you. It says always, but actually in the Greek it is all days. I am with you on all days, not always, but all days. So all of the alls are there. So let's go back and let's look at this and let's unpack it a little bit. All authority. This is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. If you've got your Bibles, if you turn back with me to Daniel chapter 7. 
This is actually an amazing thing that Matthew is tying back to the Old Testament. You know, I sometimes wonder why Christians have both an Old and New Testament, because we only read the New and we don't pay any attention to the Old. And we miss a lot if that's the case. This is a vision that Daniel saw, a night vision. And this is Daniel chapter 7. It's on page 745 if you're using the Pew Bible. And I saw the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. In the New Testament, we know who this is. Jesus ascended into heaven on the clouds of heaven. He ascended in Acts chapter 1. And we say the creed. He will come again in glory, and he will ride the clouds down again in glory. This is a description of, we know who it is, but Daniel didn't. Listen to this description. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. You recognize that. We call Jesus the Son of God, but his own title for himself and how he wanted to be understood and referred to was as the Son of Man. He's taking us back to this passage, this vision in Daniel. And he came, the Son of Man, to the Ancient of Days, to God the Father. And he was presented before God, the Ancient of Days. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. It's no wonder they worshiped him. Jesus is the son of man from Daniel chapter 7. It is a mind-boggling reference and the disciples have finally come to understand. Now, this is crazy. He's a human being. They, have, they worship, but they have some doubts. But this is who Jesus is. And Jesus reminds them and he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There isn't one little tiny piece of creation that the cosmos that doesn't belong to Jesus over which he himself does not have complete and full authority. All authority. That is the foundation. That is the platform from which we do the rest of the things in the great commandment. I'm standing here with a firm foundation beneath my feet. It isn't about me. It's not about my training. It's not about where I went to school. It's not about my credentials. It's not about my sergeant stripes. It's about Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Sir Kierkegaard had this wonderful image that he used to love to use. Uh, little Ludwig. Little Ludwig's two and a half, and little Ludwig wants to get out of the stroller, out of the pram. And so mommy lets him get out, and little Ludwig gets behind the stroller and puts his hands way up in the air, and he pushes the stroller. And he's up on his tiptoes, and he thinks he's the man. Little Ludwig, he's not in the stroller, he's pushing the stroller. Oh, I'm awesome. And if you're sitting on the park bench watching little Ludwig go by pushing the pram, well, then you know his mother is right there behind him. And she's got her hands outside of his on the handles. And she's providing the momentum and the power and the direction. And he's just kind of going along for the ride. This is what Jesus is telling us. We're just little Ludwig. All authority has been given to him. He's the mom. He's the one who's pushing the tram. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now here's where, these are the sermons I always heard. Go therefore, go, 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 go to Africa, go to New Guinea, go to the moon, go, go, go. And guilt, you're not doing enough and you need to go and go and go. He gives us four, what look in the English to be four verbs, but that's not what is in the Greek. And so we misread this. This is not a command to us to go. The command, the imperative, the verb, there's a verb in three participles. The verb is disciple. The command is disciple. The rest are participles that dance around the verb to disciple. And it's a participle. It's not a command. He doesn't say go. He says, as you are going. If you're not dead, then you're going. As you go to the store, as you go to the gas station, as you go to the gym, as you go to the club, as you go out to eat, as you go to the, the, wherever it is you are going. If you're alive, you're going. And so it's not a command to go to a certain place. Live your life. And as you are living your life, here's the verb, disciple. So the, the participle, it's the presupposition. If you're alive, then you're going. So wherever it is you go, you take Jesus with you, and you disciple people. Now, disciple, that's a school word. 
We send kids off at six years old and they come back when they're 18 and we sent them off to school. It's a process and it's protracted and it's long. And this is a crockpot word. It's not a microwave word. And this word is not the word that we usually associate with mission. Save them, convert them, evangelize them, proselytize them. Jesus doesn't say to do that. Jesus says, as you are going, invite them into, it's a school, into the school of Jesus and talk to them about Jesus and share with them about what you know about Jesus and what you're excited about, about Jesus. And God provides these divine appointments all the time and we're oblivious to them. Back in York, there was a chain store and it's moving to North Carolina, I'm excited. It's called Ollie's Good Stuff Cheap. And they carry overstocks. And so they go and Erdman's and Nelson and Zondervan and Baker Books. And you can get these first run religious books for $2.99 instead of $29.99 for the retail value of the price tag on the back. So I went to Ollie's and I loaded up my arms with a bunch of books. They were religious books. And I set them down on the counter and the little girl behind the counter starts checking them through and realizes there's a theme here. And so she starts to give me her religious resume. I grew up this and here's what I learned. And I ended up spending 20, 25 minutes at the checkout counter. She didn't care about the line that was forming. And so I was with a pastor friend of mine and we go out to the car and I'm like, this happens to me all the time. Why? I just went in to get my stuff and get out of here. And he says, Matt, next time you go to the store, watch what happens. Most people don't have that experience because they do this. They stick their nose in their wallet or in their purse and they don't make eye contact with the person behind the counter. And we communicate in 700 other ways besides verbal that we really don't care about them and we don't want to have a conversation with them. We just want to conduct our business and move on and get out of here. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Crockpot. Go slow. Take time. It's a process. It's okay if you spend 20 minutes there. We're too busy. Our lives are full of busyness and schedules and appointments and we overbook ourselves and we can't be the people that Jesus wants us to be. As you are going, be who you are. We are disciples. That's the verb, disciples of Christ. He doesn't say apostles. He doesn't say bishops. He doesn't say pope. He doesn't say ministers. He doesn't say prophets. He doesn't say priests. He doesn't say, we're disciples. Disciple is somebody simply who has entered into this school of discipleship. And it's not for special Christians or special people who go get training. This is an encouragement to all of us. We are all to do this thing of discipleship. And it's just being who we are wherever it is we are as we are going. It's not that we decide oh, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to this place or to this person and I'm going to drop a God bomb on them. And that's, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Take your time. <clears throat> Be easy. Just invest in people and spend time. And over the course of time, and according to Young Life, you'll win the right to be heard. And over the course of time and in the context of relationship, because that's what Jesus did with his disciples. They hung out for three years. They went with him everywhere he went. They observed what he was doing. They asked him questions. This is the way that we're supposed to do it. But we've been told, oh, no, no, you got to go, 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 go. And you got to go do this and that. And you got to put a notch on your belt and save them and proselytize them and evangelize them. And Jesus doesn't use any of those words. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing. What's the big deal about getting a little bit wet? Baptizing, but it's not baptizing itself. It's baptizing into the name. And that's a term that comes from banking in the ancient world. You're being baptized into the account of, into the possessions of, into the legacy and the heritage and the, all the goodies from a, a will. All of that stuff is yours. You're being initiated into the Christian community. So we are to encourage people as we are going to move them toward baptism. Now the question always gets asked, is baptism safe? And the answer of the church historically has always been, Ordinarily, yes, but extraordinarily, no. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized, but he's with Jesus. So God can save however God chooses to save. But ordinarily, Jesus is commanding us to baptize. Baptism is important. It's initiation into the community. But it's more than that. 
that we get a new family. We have a new father, Jesus Christ, and the father of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our sibling. He's our brother. And all that God has is ours into the name of. The name represents the totality of who that person is. So all of the omniscience, all of the omnipresence, all of the, um, um, what's the other one? Um, um, omni omnipotence, all of his grace, all of his love. We get all of that stuff. It's ours. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 1.3. Memorize this. I, I think about this a lot. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. When we get baptized, we're under new management and we get all of this stuff. We've got his account. We walk around and act like we're paupers and act like we got nothing and we've got it all. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus and now it's available to us because we've been baptized into that name. All of that belongs not just to Jesus, it belongs to us as well. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's Trinity Sunday, I tip my hat. I'll let you listen to Carol. Teaching them to observe. Teaching, again, it's a process word. It's a crockpot word. It's more a picture of students sitting around a teacher and learning than it is a penitence kneeling at a revival and having a crisis of faith. It's a process word, teaching. You don't, you don't have it all at once. And it happens after we're baptized. We continue to learn all that Jesus has commanded us. And I love that that's in the past tense. It ties us to the Jesus of history. It ties us to the pre crucifixion, pre-resurrection Jesus, and the things that he taught us in the scriptures. In other words, it's about verses, not about visions. It's not the mystical Jesus. It's the Jesus of the New Testament. It's the Jesus of the scriptures. It's not the Jesus of our feelings. Sorry, Oprah, we don't look within ourselves. We look to what Jesus has commanded us in the pages of the scriptures. All that I have commanded them now, I want to go back for just a moment. Go, therefore, and make disciples. That's the verb. That's the thrust of this passage. Make disciples of all nations. Panta te ethne is the Greek. All nations. If you've got your Bibles, do me a favor and turn with me back to Genesis. The end of Matthew's gospel, the end of the story that Matthew is telling us, ties back into the Old Testament. There's a reason why we have an Old Testament. This is the fulfillment of a promise that God made all the way back in Genesis. He actually, Matthew is using the same words, the same verbiage. Matthew, uh, Genesis chapter 12, page 8 in your Bibles if you're using the Pew Bible. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and in him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families or all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Pantate ethne. And then in chapter 18, all nations, 1818. In chapter 22, verse 18, word for word is what Matthew is quoting, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, the, Pent, uh, the Septuagint. He's using the same words here to all the nations. That what Jesus is doing is the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in the beginning of our Bibles. He's been working out this promise. And the format is the same. He says he gives him something to do, but first he tells him who he is, all authority in heaven and on earth, and then he tells him, I'm going to do all of these things. He gives him assurances. He gives him promises. And then he says, now go have an adventure. Abram, get up and go to the land I will show you. By the way, he didn't talk to him again for another nine years. So he's off having an adventure, doing what God commanded him to do. Get up and go. And that's what he wants for us. The life, our life in Christ should be an adventure and it should be fun. It shouldn't be, oh, he commanded me to do this and I hate this and I'm not Billy Graham and I don't have that gift and I don't want to do this. And, and we make it something that it's not. We're alive. We're going. That's what we do when we're alive. And as we're going, we just be who we are, the people who now belong to God in Jesus Christ, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. 
And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's actually all days. I will be with you on all days, your good days and your bad days, your spiritual days and the days when you didn't have a quiet time. I will be with you. It's mom pushing the pram with little Ludwig at her feet, just tripping along in front of her. It's an adventure. We make it this thing where I'm supposed to put a guilt trip on you and send you out into the community. And that's not what this is. Jesus is saying, look, I'm doing this thing all the way from Genesis all the way to the end of the scriptures. And it's an adventure and I'm inviting you to come in and be a part of it. And I'll use you just like you are doubting worshipers. It's awesome. This isn't the way, I mean, I'm glad I got a chance to study. This isn't the way that I've been had it preached to me. This isn't the way that I've understood it. We're just little Ludwigs. Grab hold of the handle and start tripping down the street because he's with us always, even to the end of the age. And who is the one who's with us? The one who has authority over all heaven and all earth. We don't do this. He does this, and he just lets us come along for the ride.